Appalachians have been victims of pervasive stereotypes for the last 200 years. For those outside of the greater Appalachian region, hyperbolic rumors, media, and stories infect the American population with greatly exaggerated glimpses into life in the mountains. Even those considered local to Appalachia fall prey to the stereotypes they have been exposed to while growing up. The redneck moniker, living without shoes, and particularly the banjo, courtesy of the movie Deliverance, are simply a few of the stereotypes that live throughout the minds of Americans and even some people in foreign countries. While in some cases, these examples of poverty and backwardness have a small root in truth, it has gotten out of hand in today's world. No group of people should suffer from the stereotypes that surround them. Instead, we should be encouraged to visit these places and learn for ourselves. The Appalachian people are proud, and most don't care what the outside world thinks about them. They prefer the privacy these stereotypes give them. However, when the history books write the history of this region, we must avoid leaving these stereotypes as the main components of the daily life of an Appalachian. It does no justice to the people of the past or people in the future who will be learning about the region. We must understand how these stereotypes begin to infect and how to sift through them to find the truth. The largest component of Appalachian religion is the Protestant division of Christianity. Particularly in rural communities, Southern Baptists and other Christian sects dominate the landscape as anyone can experience with a simple drive down any road in the region. In urban communities, Christianity still overwhelms most other religions, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. These more urban Appalachian cities have strong populations of Jewish, Islamic, and Buddhist communities peppered throughout the greater Appalachian region. These regions help make Appalachia the melting pot that it is and has been for a long time. Appalachia and Appalachian religion experiences such a massive stereotype campaign due to the actions of CORA, the Commission on Religion in Appalachia. A snowball effect of historical proportions led to this organization labeling an innocent population as poor, backwards, and unable to fend for themselves without modern Protestantism. The first people to inform the world on a new subject often serve as the gatekeepers of this information. This allows them to paint whatever picture they like and cause it to stick. When Winston Churchill said, history is written by the victors, he shared a similar sentiment. Until the 1850s, Appalachia had not yet been defined culturally. It wasn't until then that people began to think of this region as different from others found in the mountains. In October of 1973, a man by the name of William Harney wrote, A Strange Land and Peculiar People. Originally published by Lippincott's Magazine, this work is considered to be one of the first that identifies Appalachia as a place of its own. As you can tell from the title, this piece would go on to characterize this newly recognized group of people as peculiar and strange. Horace Kephart became the next great disinformationist in the campaign to stereotype Appalachia as homogeneous and in need of outside intervention. His piece, Our Southern Highlanders, written in 1913, would go on to be an integral part of Cora and their subsequent religious campaign in the region. Kephart lived in Appalachia for a time, but seemed to belittle the people and places of the region in his works. He believed Appalachia needed saving from their backwards ways and wanted to force them to live and farm the way Midwesterners did. Putting the sheer ridiculousness of this belief aside, logic would prove to any critical thinker that they can't live exactly like Midwestern farmers because the terrain is unlike that of the Midwest. Of course, there are works like A Week in the Great Smoky Mountains and The Spirit of the Mountains by Emma Bell Miles, written in 1860 and 1905 respectively, that showed readers a more romantic view of the South, often drawing people into mountain life through their written lens. Unfortunately, these pieces did little to sway back the pendulum that had already been brought on by more stereotypical works. In 1931, the Institute of Social and Religious Research ran a survey focused on Appalachian religion. Although the survey included West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, it only accounted for 1,000 churches in 17 counties. They honed in on specific metrics such as church attendance, denomination type, and church organization. As it turned out, their selection of counties only included extremely rural areas and completely failed to take into account any urban areas that belonged to the Appalachian region. This meant cities such as Knoxville, Asheville, Bristol, and others were simply left out because it wouldn't back up their claim that Appalachia was completely filled with uneducated hillbillies. The stereotypes created by the early disinformationists created a bias in the study before it was implemented. Later, in the 1950s, 
Another survey would back up the original survey's conclusions that Appalachia was indeed a strange backward place that needed missionaries and church intervention as soon as possible. Interesting to note were the survey's results. The survey in 1931 showed that Baptists and Methodists had the highest percentage of the population citizens at 39.8% and 33.4% respectively. The only other category listed was non-Protestant, which accounted for 2% of the population. These results gathered from some of the rural counties of Appalachia would be used to define the entire greater Appalachian region. The issue with these conclusions, as any local would know, is that Appalachia is not only defined by its rural population, but also its urban population, as the two sides are connected at the hip when it comes to culture, history, and daily life. In 1965, CORA was created. Fueled by the slanted religious survey conducted over the years, the organization thought that all Appalachia needed was missionaries and Protestantism to align them back to the values they thought were proper for American citizens. Naturally, after the surveys, evangelists galore were chomping at the bit to venture out into Appalachia and share the gospel with the backward and peculiar people of Appalachia. Cora shared their sentiment and would provide the spark that would lead to an influx of religious zealots. Current scholars of the time, including, but not limited to Earl Brewer and Willis D. Weatherford, would inject their prejudiced beliefs into the ether where Cora would use them to justify their approach. As happens when religion faces off against science, Earl Brewer himself didn't think his own religiously held beliefs would work due to the population's diversity. Yet, he continued to propose illogical, religiously fueled goals for the region. His view of Appalachia as a diverse place filled with both science and religion was not shared with Cora or any of the other contemporaries. The founders of Cora used all the stereotyped information they had access to so they could justify their characterization of Appalachia as poor, backward, and strange. They did this simply because they wanted an excuse to force more Christian missionaries into the region. In 1966, the chairman of Cora's planning commission, John Sweeney, had this to say about the region of Appalachia. Before even talking about it, I'm going to define Appalachia in a way that I think was suggested in Dr. Nessius' talk this morning. It is obviously not all the square miles nor all the people that are defined in the Appalachian Regional Development Act, that section of the United States that's up on the map on the wall in there, because so much of that Appalachia is just like the rest of the United States. The great cities of the region, the college towns of the region, they have problems and they are similar to the rest of the United States, but they are not the kinds of problems that demand a special Appalachian effort, and we'll eliminate them from this discussion now. He made it a point to convince others that Appalachia was no different than any other region of America and didn't need any special consideration when it came to lifting them up from poverty. So Cora, with the help of missionaries and agencies, flocked to the area to save the people and continue to bring them Christianity. They ignored the complexity of the melting pot of urban and rural places Appalachia brings with it. Because of this, the stereotypes prevailed and their efforts to lift the Appalachians out of poverty only serve to open them up to ridicule and belittlement that still attaches to them today. This is part of the reason why you will hear things like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, they're poor because they are lazy, or God puts you through challenges to make you tougher. People all over America, but specifically in the South, use these phrases to continue those Appalachian religious stereotypes that began way back in the 1800s. The greatest mistake you can make about either an ethnic population or a cultural population is that they are in any way similar to another group or that they will respond in a similar manner as another group. Appalachians have long suffered from these illogical beliefs. The combination of early stereotypes, skewed religion-based surveys, and Cora led to the long-time belief that Appalachian people were backward. This allowed religion to dominate a potential solution rather than a proper examination of the factors that play into such a complex culture. We have seen this happen time and time again in America, whether it was the Native Americans, African slaves, the Appalachian people, or other immigrants. America has had a nasty history of forcing religion onto a group of people who don't share the same culture as them. It's extremely ironic for a country that was founded on the separation of church and state.